All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we're going to get started with today's video lesson. And today we're going to talk a little bit about enzymes and what uh, catalysts are and, and how enzymes are a type of catalysts. And it's pretty simple. Uh, okay, just let me reintroduce that just in case. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about enzymes um, and catalysts. And I'm actually going to start sharing my whiteboard with you guys real quick. And that way I uh, will go over some of the more important concepts that were discussed in class today. Um, and hopefully be able to help you guys uh, understand the material a little bit better. So today we started on page 52 and we started talking about catalysts. So, um, actually gonna, we're gonna start from that point. Okay. So enzymes and catalysts, or what is a catalyst? So we know that an activation and what activation energy is in a reaction, activation energy in a reaction is the energy needed to, uh, start a chemical reaction. So we, we know that, right. And let's just review that real quick. Activation energy is the energy added to start a chemical reaction. And in the last video that I uploaded, I kind of explained to you guys what activation, um, what, what um, activation energy was, is basically kind of like pushing a rock up the hill. And once you got to that point, then the rock would go downhill all on its own. So it's it's a similar concept. Um, but here's what we're gonna we're, we're we're gonna focus on today. Even though activation energy is added to a chemical reaction, sometimes um, it it may happen very slowly. So sometimes chemical reactions can happen slowly. These are things that can affect the chemical reaction. Things that affect the chemical reaction that can affect a chemical reaction. One is that um, it may happen very slowly. Two is that, um, let me see if I can get this out of the way real quick. There you go. One is that it can happen very slowly. Two is that the reaction uh, or the reactants may not interact enough. Interact enough. Apparently, I was typing and it wasn't typing back. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. The reactants may not interact enough Let me separate this. They may not interact enough Um or there may not have a high uh, enough concentration. It may not have a high enough concentration. It may not have a high enough concentration um, to form the product of the reaction. Of a reaction. So again, these are, there, there could be other factors, but these are the three that we're at least going to focus on in this video in order to talk about the, uh, the uh, talk about enzymes and chemical reactions. And um, again, or catalysts, excuse me, Three things that can happen is that one, um, in a chemical reaction, it, it may happen very slowly, uh, depending on what type of chemical reaction. Number two is that the reactants may not 
um, or that the reactants may not interact enough. Like the reactants needed may, may not interact enough to generate that energy that is needed. Um, and thirdly, is that there simply may not be enough concentration uh, concentration for the product or to to for the product of a reaction to form. Okay, so um, let me see if I can delete that. We'll see. Let's see if I can delete that. Okay, so that last part was that there. One is that there. There, again, the it may happen very slowly. The reactants may not interact. And the last one that I typed there was that the um, there may not be high enough concentration. In those cases, a catalyst needs to be used. So let's define catalyst. And according to your textbooks, a catalyst is. a substance that decreases the activation energy. That decreases the activation energy. Activation energy. Needed. Start a chemical reaction. Okay, so a catalyst is a substance that is that decreases the activation energy. That is uh, a catalyst is a, a substance that decreases the activation energy needed to start a chemical reaction. So what a catalyst does is it decreases the activation energy so that way the reaction can start. And I'm going to try to explain that with the diagram. Or try There's a diagram on page 52, I believe, of your textbook that kind of tries to explain it. So I'm actually going to go ahead and see if I can do it. And let's say we have a chemical reaction. As we know, Activation energy, um, activation energy is the energy needed so that the reaction can start. So it'll it'll it, it'll start the reaction. Then it'll have kind of like this curve or this bell-like curve, and so the reaction is going to occur, of course, until it's in equilibrium. Especially if we're talking about uh, a reaction in living organisms, right? And we know that, let's say, this arrow that I'm about to draw actually represents actually represents the activation energy needed. So I'm going to abbreviate that, abbreviate that, excuse me, as activation energy A E. Um, so, and of course that activation energy, again, we talk about the example of, of someone pushing a rock up a hill when it gets to this point, the rock will pretty much start rolling down on its own. But what a, a catalyst does is kind of the opposite. So what a catalyst does is it, it diminishes, it reduces the activation energy needed. So a catalyst, and we'll talk about enzymes in a minute, which are specific types of catalysts. A catalyst basically does this. It decreases the activation energy and it lowers like the curve, or, or at least in this case, it's being represented by a curve. It's like I was saying in class, it's kind of like when a teacher lowers the curve of a test or a quiz to you know make it... Uh, easier for certain students, right? So the activation energy kind of does the same thing. It lowers the curve. It lowers the curve, meaning that there is less energy needed to start the chemical reaction. And we'll call this a catalyst. Okay, so this is a catalyst. And this is 
what a catalyst does. It'll decrease that activation energy. And they're very important. Uh, or this is very important, especially in biological um, reactions. And we're going to talk about some in a minute where we'll have catalysts, which in, in our case is, is, are called enzymes. So again, this is the, this little, the lower arrow is actually a catalyst. And what it does is it lowers the activation energy needed for the reaction to get started. All right. So now let's talk specifically about um, enzymes. All right. Or, or let's talk a little bit more about catalysts. And one important thing is that catalysts, are not considered to be reactants or product. Okay, so in a reaction, catalysts, catalysts are not considered to be, catalysts are not considered to be either reactants or products. or products to be either reactants or products because catalysts are not changed during a reaction. Catalysts are not changed during a reaction. Catalysts are not changed during a reaction because they don't change. Remember that in a chemical reaction, there has to be a change. The reactants have to change into products and there needs to be activation energy added in order for that reaction to start. Okay. So again, catalysts don't change. Uh, we have reactants, you have products and the catalysts basically lower the activation energy so the reaction can occur. So let's let's move on. And we're going to, before we start talking about, we're going to start talking about enzymes. And enzymes are basically a, a type of catalysts. So we can say that enzymes are catalysts for chemical reactions in living things. So they're not the only types of catalysts, but they are catalysts um, that are present in reactions of living organisms. So we are going to define enzymes as our catalysts that catalysts um, are catalysts for chemical reactions. I'm sorry, for chemical or that are present in chemical reactions in living organisms. Okay, so enzymes are not the only type of reactants. However, enzymes are reactants or are catalysts, excuse me. Enzymes are not the only catalysts, but they are the catalysts that are present in um, living organisms. Okay. Okay. And speaking of enzymes, there are specific or special types of, of uh, catalysts. And it says that in reactions uh, that are reversible or in reversible reactions, such as the carbon dioxide and the um, carbonic acid reaction. Um, they do not change the direction of the reaction. They just change the amount of energy. So enzymes in reversal reactions, such as the carbon dioxide and the uh, carbonic acid reactions, enzymes do not
they do not change the direction of the reaction enzymes do not change the direction of the reaction only only um, the amount of time needed for equilibrium to be reached only the amount of time for equilibrium to be reached. So, and this is very important because if equilibrium isn't reached in that reaction specifically, and we have an excess amount of carbon dioxide or an excess amount of carbonic acid, that can be um, very uh, dangerous. So it's important that these uh, the enzymes uh, change that activation energy or, or, or they just kind of lower the activation energy for equilibrium to be reached. It says, this means that enzymes do not change the reaction of the, they just change the amount of time needed for equilibrium to be reached. And enzymes are involved in almost every process in living organisms from breaking down food to building proteins. So enzymes are present. Enzymes are involved in almost every process in organisms in almost every process in organisms Enzymes are involved in almost every process in organisms, from breaking down foods to building proteins. To building proteins. To building proteins. For example, or an example of this, enzymes in saliva, enzymes in saliva um, break down starch into simpler sugars. Enzymes in saliva, such as amylase, break down starches into simple sugars. So what I was explaining in class is that when we chew food, um, the saliva turns that food into that paste, right? To like a paste comp compost, I don't know, and we're able to swallow it. And that actually helps the digestive process start. So the digestive process actually begins once you, you bite the food, then the saliva um, catalyzes that reaction and makes it easier for us to swallow. So that's an example of, uh, of, of how enzymes in our bodies work. Uh, another way is that they're important in our immune system, okay? Specifically in binding sites. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So enzymes are also important. in our immune systems, in our immune systems, in our immune systems or for our immune systems. It says each enzyme also depends on its structure to function property. This is important. Each enzyme, each enzyme depends on its depends on its structure to function property give me one second ladies and gentlemen my computer just told me that if i don't charge it soon it will stop so let me hurry up as fast as i can so pardon all the fumbling and bumbling um 
Give me one sec. And we're back. Pardon that awkward silence. I uh, forgot that my computer needed to charge. Okay, so as I was saying, each enzyme depends on its structure to function property. Its structure to function property. And what that means is that enzymes are very specific. And if for some reason their structure is altered, um, that's going to really um, affect how it's supposed to function or the function that it's supposed to undergo. Okay. So we're going to continue. Let's see if I can delete this side of the whiteboard. And that way we can continue with some uh, more properties of the enzymes right here. Okay. So um, again, it depends on its structure to function property. Uh, it says that enzymes work best in a small temperature range around the organism. Okay, enzymes. That means that they're very heat sensitive. Enzymes work best in a small a small temperature range around the organisms around the organisms normal body temperature Enzymes work best in a small temperature range around the organism's normal body temperature. And I was explaining uh, to, to you guys in class that, for example, and I gave you a small example. This is not the only one. But when you get a high fever and your mouth gets dry, um, you know, you need to drink water, you need to stay hydrated. If, if you don't have access to water and you try to eat, it's going to be almost impossible it's not that it's not going to happen. It's just going to be very difficult for the digestive process to begin because the saliva, um, which is in our mouths, uh, you know, pretty much dries up when our, when our body temperature is really high and it's going to be really hard for us to, to swallow and to start that digestive process. This is not the only, uh, protein or, uh, enzyme that is affected, but a lot of other enzymes in our bodies are affected when the temperature, our body temperature raises. Okay. Um, it says many uh, enzymes in humans work best nearly by a, at a nearly neutral pH. So enzymes are also affected by pH. Are sensitive, I guess you want to say to changes in pH are sensitive, just realize I wrote sens sensitive, are sensitive to changes in pH, are sensitive to changes in pH And in humans, enzymes work best at a neutral pH. In humans, enzymes work best at a neutral pH. Okay. Enzymes work best at a neutral pH. So moving on to the uh, next topic or thing that we're going to talk about in terms of enzymes is that enzyme structure 
is important because each enzyme shapes uh, certain reactants to bind to the enzyme. Okay, so so let me let me. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but let me um let me explain that real quick. Okay, so let me write that down. Enzyme structure is important, or an enzyme structure. is important important because each enzyme shape shape each enzyme shape uh, allows only certain reactants allows only certain reactants to bind it to the enzyme. So again, Structure is important because each enzyme is really specific. It's really, really, really picky. So a specific enzyme will, um, uh, or the shape of a specific enzyme only allows a certain reactant to bind to it. it so it, it, it shapes itself in a way where only one specific um, um reactant will bind to it. Well, only one specific reactant will bind to it. Like for example, let's say the enzyme has this weird shape. It's kind of like a Lego. The only thing that can bind to it will be that specific reactant, it nothing else, nothing else will possibly bind to that area. Nothing else will possibly bind to that area that is not that specific protein or that specific reactant. Okay, so that's why it's so important that the enzymes maintain their shape. And which brings us to our next um, definition, which is substrate so a substrate is or the specific reactant i think it's better if i do it that way the specific reactant the specific reactant um that an enzyme acts on a specific reactant that an enzyme axon is called a substrate. The specific reactant that an enzyme axon is called a substrate. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. And again, substrate is is Basically, and let me let me read a little bit. It says amyl amylase. Amylase only breaks down starches. Um, therefore, starch is a substrate for amyl amylase. So, basically, the the whatever an enzyme acts on, like for example, they talk about amylase. Um, let's say this is the amylase right here. This is the amylase. Right here, this little red one. And we'll just say it's E for enzyme. And this right here is the substrate or the you know what i drew in black it's the substrate so the red the enzyme 
acts on a specific substrate. And whatever it, whatever the enzyme is acting on is what we call the substrate, okay? So um, one thing that we discussed in class is the key lock model. And basically the key lock model, which we're gonna discuss right now, um, states that, Let's see. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I got lost there for a minute. It says, substrates temporarily bind to enzymes at specific places called active sites. So let's let's write that down. Right. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so right here. Um, again, let's talk about that real quick. Um, it says substrates temporarily bind to enzymes at specific places. Substrate temporarily temporarily let me see if I can change that color <laughs> I didn't realize it was using pink I think that one result like it, it, it'll blend a little better substance or substrates temporarily bind sorry about that bind to Enzymes at specific places at specific places called active sites. So if we go back to this very rustic, to say the least, um, drawing here, you see this little indentation Let's see if I can use a different color. Uh, let's see if I can use this blue. This little indentation here that I drew, which is kind of like where it's bent. That's where the red malt red enzyme, right? What I drew in red binds. This right here, that specific, what I drew in blue, that specific indentation in this case is what we call the active site, which is the place this the exact place where they they bond. Okay, so that's called the active. I'm just gonna write active. But you guys get my drift, the active site. Okay, the active site. The active site okay so that's the specific place uh, where the substrate temporarily bonds to or with the protein or the enzyme excuse me we all know that the enzyme can be proteins but are, are, are be are, are present in the form of proteins but in this case it just talks about the enzyme okay so um So th again, I'm sorry. Uh, substrates temporarily bond to enzymes at specific place called active sites in the same way that a key uh, fits into a lock. Substrates exactly fill the active sites. So the, the, the fact that substrates temporarily bind to enzymes at specific sites is what we call the key lock model. Okay, This right here is the key lock model because it's explaining key lock model. It's explaining that the protein, the enzyme will act on a substrate at a specific active site. At a specific active site. It's not gonna be anywhere else that is not that specific site. Okay, so that's the key lock model. And we're going to talk about some of the steps involved in the key lock model 
and and that will pretty much be it for our lesson. And the first thing that we're going to talk about in the key lock model, or the first step, is to understand that um, enzymes bring substrate molecules close together. Okay, so the first thing is that enzymes. First of all, let me talk. Let me title this. This is the key lock model. We're going to explain that. And we're obviously summarizing it, very general. But the first thing is that enzymes bring substrate molecules close together. Enzymes bring substrate molecules. Enzymes bring substrate molecules close together. So the enzymes bring the molecules, the substrate molecules, close together. They kind of compact them, right? And then second says that enzymes decrease activation energy. Enzymes decrease activation energy. Okay, activation energy. Um, enzymes decrease activation energy. Um, it says that when enzymes bind, or excuse me, when substrates bind to the enzymes in the active sites, when substrates, when substrates bind to the enzyme, bind to the enzymes, the substrate bind to the en enzymes in the active sites, in the active sites, in the active sites, the bonds inside those molecules become strained. The bond inside those molecules become strained. Okay, the bonds inside those molecules become strained. Okay, so what's happening is that as the, the first thing is that the enzyme brings um, substrate molecules close together. So these molecules right here where the green arrow is, they, they come close together. Then the enzymes decrease the activation energy, and what that means is that the enzyme will will. Let me see if I can use the marker. Okay, so again, this is the substrate down here where the green arrow is and the letter S. And the first thing is that these molecules are being bonded close together because of the enzymes, right? And then the second thing that happens is that the enzyme right here, the red molecule that I drew, is going to make these molecules very unstable. They're going to strain them. And when they strain them, that causes the activation energy to, to, to decrease. Okay? So that's very, very summarized, the, the key lock model. And um, one thing about the key lock model, it's, it's not so much that the substrate changes, but rather the enzyme kind of kind of uh, forms. What happens in reality is that the enzyme right here, um, what's happening, or what scientists have discovered, is that the enzyme is kind of molding around the substrate, not necessarily the other way around. And of course, as the enzyme molds around the substrate, it causes the molecules to come back together, which causes the bonds to be strained. So that's something that the scientists, scientists, excuse me, uh, discovered a little bit later on. And the last thing is that um, the bending of the enzyme is one way in which bonds in substances are weakened. So let me just write that down real quick here the the ending the bending 
of the enzyme of the enzyme the bending of the enzyme is one way in which bonds in substrates are weakened is one way in which bonds in substrates are weakened so guys this is our video lesson for today hopefully you guys were able to understand i apologize for the interruptions such as the background noise of dogs barking roosters um and um a leaf blower and of course my little mishap with the computer <laughs> almost running out of battery anyway guys stay safe and we'll see each other in our next class so i hope you enjoy the rest of your day bye bye